Syria. Senator Ludlam. Uh, thanks, Mr Deputy President. Um, I move that parliamentary approval should be required for Australian forces to be deployed to Syria. Deputy President uh, and colleagues, you will be aware that uh, I think it was the first bill that I introduced when I came into this uh, place in mid-2008 was to pick up a bill by uh, former Democrat Senator Andrew Bartlett on parliamentary approval for Australian troops to deploy into conflict zones. And it's a bill that had been on the notice paper in this place in one form or another since the mid-1980s. Um, and I acknowledge the work uh, in particular of the former clerk of the Senate, Harry Evans, who was a long-time advocate for the transfer of what is called um, somewhat casually the war power from the executive to the parliament. And this may sound a little bit dry and anodyne, but what it means in principle and in practice is this. At the moment, there is nothing at all preventing a Prime Minister of Australia on advice of a very, very small handful of individuals from, from deploying the Australian Defence Force into a theatre of war on the other side of the world, no matter what the consequences, without thinking through the strategic uh, situation, without thinking through the risk to those on the ground, without thinking through or properly evaluating the risk to the personnel that we'd be sending overseas, whether our participation in such a conflict would make matters worse. Um, and I am very strongly of the view, as are many other supporters of the proposal for parliamentary approval, that that decision should never again rest in the hands of the Prime Minister alone. And I made a deliberate decision not today to bring that bill back for debate in this chamber. It's been debated and voted on twice. It has been defeated twice uh, by the government uh, voting in concert with the opposition because the executive prefers to keep this power to itself. I am very strongly of the view that the bill and many of the arguments surrounding it by its opponents have been thoroughly mischaracterised, and I'll go into that in a little bit of detail this afternoon. But principally, the argument is this. If the lessons of 2003, where Prime Minister John Howard committed Australian forces to an illegal invasion of another country on the other side of the world, that resulted in the unravelling of the security environment in Iraq and resulted in the consequences in part that we, that we are today grappling with, the emergence of a vicious uh, insurgency that has developed almost in viral form to something that now calls itself, and indeed, as some analysts have pointed out, exhibits some of the characteristics of a state, were born in that cauldron of hideous sectarian violence in Iraq, particularly during and around and immediately after 2006. And that that decision to invade Iraq on false pretenses, not because intelligence services read the situation wrong, as I think they have been quite unfairly blamed on, but that politicians warped and twisted the intelligence reports that they were being given uh, by entities here in Australia, such as the ONA and their counterparts in the United States and the UK, that politicians twisted the meaning of the defence and the intelligence reports that they were being given to suit a predetermined political agenda which was to unseat Saddam Hussein and remake the Middle East in the image of secular Western democracies. Well, hasn't that been a resounding and spectacular success? And if we needed more of a profound argument as to why the decision to send Australians into war should be made in this place, in this parliament, here in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, it is that grotesque miscalculation in 2003. And to then turn around and pin the blame on our intelligence services that they got it wrong, let's hold an inquiry into how they got it wrong, really compounds the injustice. Decided, however, that this motion today would be a standalone, that it represents the principle that the Australian Greens and our allies inside and outside this parliament have been arguing for years picking up where the Australian Democrats left off, that this parliament is the proper place for those decisions to be made. I want to make this distinction very clear at the outset. Parliament should not involve itself once the decision has been made to deploy into conflict in tactical or battlefield decisions, and that is not the purpose of this bill. So I have no doubt whatsoever that government and opposition senators will shortly find and hear and tell us that parliament isn't qualified uh, to run the conduct of a war on the other side of the world. And it isn't. Those are strategic and tactical decisions for military commanders in the event that a deployment is considered justified and necessary. 
The decision, however, to participate in wars of choice, which is what this is, that is a political decision. And it is my firm view that before we line up in front of flags and farewell Australian service personnel who may not return or who may indeed return broken, that we should sign our names in this place if we support such a deployment and that we should consider very, very carefully the consequences not just for those that we send overseas but those also who will be subject uh, to that Australian military commitment on the far side of the world. And here again we see, more than a decade later, 12 years later, a Prime Minister unilaterally, having clearly made up his mind already, unilaterally committing Australian personnel into the Syrian civil war. Now, I heard the comments that Mr Abbott has already made, uh, those of the Defence Minister this morning, almost unbelievably vague in intent as to the purpose of this deployment. Its necessity, its purpose, its outcome, its objectives, its legality. Vague barely even does it justice. How long will we be there? What are the success criteria? Can they demonstrate in any meaningful sense at all? And I genuinely invite this as a response from government senators and those on the Labor Party side who again have uncritically signed off and simply failed to turn up to work. Can you show us that this won't make things worse? Because it is not just the view of the Australian Greens that hurling Australian munitions into the Syrian civil war will make things worse. It is the view of many others in the diplomatic community and in the defence community here and overseas that Australia is not merely another foreign combatant just trying to do our bit to preserve the global order, but that this may in fact be precisely the wrong time for another foreign power to be intervening militarily in the Syrian civil war. On the news wires just before I came down here, there appears to be confirmation uh, that the Russian government which has long been understood to be providing uh, weapons and training and material support, substantial material support to the Assad regime, now has, in the vernacular, boots on the ground. That Russian combat forces are in fact engaged uh, against parties that are as yet unknown. And that US Secretary of State John Kerry has talked a number of times to his Russian counterpart expressing extreme concern on behalf of the United, behalf of the United States government that uh, Yet another foreign military party now is engaged in the Syrian civil war. And Mr Kerry's comments, in my view, are justified and are accurate, in that any power that could take a good look at what the Assad regime has done to its own people since March 2011 and back them in uncritically, as the Putin regime has done, uh, is utterly unconscionable. And yet Mr Kerry's warning could just as equally apply not just to the United States government but indeed to Australia's, that this is not the time for further escalation of military violence inside Syria. This is the time for demilitarising that benighted country as locals on the ground are attempting to do. I see Senator Back frowning, and I'll let you speak for yourself, Senator Back. There are indeed the first tentative signs of regional ceasefire zones inside Syria that locals on the ground, secular and otherwise, uh, are attempting to widen into a so-called freeze across certain parts of the country where for periods of time, sometimes quite brief and in some instances for longer periods of time, the fighting ceases that allows aid agencies or, local, uh, or locals to get in with food and supplies to those uh, in, who have been just suffering uh, horrific adversity such as uh, most of us in here could not even imagine. The United States, of course, doesn't have clean hands in this regard either. And it is fascinating, uh, those analysts who have taken the time to look at the State Department cables that were released by WikiLeaks um, and look at what the United States administration was doing uh, around the time of 2006. And I'm going to quote briefly from Robert Naiman, one of the few analysts who's actually taken the time to go through the WikiLeaks State Department cables and analyse what was US government foreign policy in Syria at the time that President Bush was desperately trying to contain, with the surge, with the troop surge, the extraordinary sectarian violence that was unleashed across Iraq around 2006. This is what Mr Naiman says. 
The cable suggests that the US goal in December 2006 was to undermine the Syrian government by any available means, and that what mattered was whether US action would help destabilise the government, not what other impacts the action might have. In public, the United States was opposed to Islamist terrorists everywhere, but in private, it saw the potential threat to the regime from the increasing presence of transiting Islamist extremists as an opportunity that the US should take action to try and increase. And there you have it, the consequences that now unfold. And it's not the United States government paying the price. It's not the Russian authorities paying the price. It's the people of Syria. He goes on in the WikiLeaks files. By De uh, but in, in December 2006, he writes, the man hitting the United States Embassy in Syria advocated in a cable to the Secretary of State and the White House that the US government collaborate with Saudi Arabia and Egypt to promote sectarian conflict in Syria between Sunni and Shia as a means of destabilizing the Syrian government. US public disgust, he goes on, with the sectarian civil war in Iraq unleashed by the US invasion had just cost Republicans control of Congress in the November 2006 election. The election result immediately precipitated the resignation of Donald Rumsfeld as Secretary of Defense. No one working for the US government on foreign policy at the time could have been unaware of the implications of promoting Sunni Shia sectarianism. And now we see, not that long afterwards, less than a decade later, uh, Syria itself ripped apart as Iraq has been. Not through an active campaign of bombing and shock and awe and mission accomplished, as we saw unfolding over the skies of Baghdad in 2003, but quietly, with weapons, with cash, with support, uh, overt and covert, not just for the moderate democratic forces or the Free Syrian Army, as, as has been on the record for years, but for, uh, for quite vicious Islamist subgroups and splinter groups that has now ripped that country apart. Uh, and Australians and others who have watched Syria effectively bleed to death since March 2011, I would propose bear some foreign policy responsibility, as does the Iranian government, as does the Russian government, as does the Turkish government, who have used this entire horror show as an excuse simply to persecute uh, Kurdish minorities inside and outside of Turkey. Nobody has clean hands, and yet it is the people of Syria who have paid the price. And so are we, uh, are we tilting at windmills to imagine that there is any kind of peaceful solution to what is going on in Syria or indeed Iraq at the moment? Uh, my colleague Senator Hanson Young uh, and some of her uh, colleagues and allies in this parliament who have put political differences and allegiances aside to argue and advocate in the cause of the asylum seekers and those refugees fleeing not in their hundreds of thousands but in their millions from Syria and from Iraq yesterday heard from uh, the UNHCR's um, uh, lead in the Middle East and North Africa. And one of the things that he told us, uh, as, as many in this place, staff and journalists who participated in that briefing will know, that there is simply no military solution. There is no military endgame in Syria, and recent history surely teaches us that, but that we need to be looking towards a peace process he can, and those are the words that he used, he cannot undertake his mission in protecting those people fleeing from the Syrian civil war without a peace process. And as far as that may seem from the uh, post-apocalyptic scenes that uh, those Syrians have experienced and have indeed fled from, as far as that process has been, uh, appears to be from where we are today, it is incumbent upon us in this parliament whether we support the Prime Minister's reckless and counterproductive deployment of the ADF into the skies over Syria, whether we support that deployment or not, we should surely be doing everything that we can to promote demilitarisation, de-escalation of violence inside Syria. Uh, that is something that I believe uh, others of my colleagues uh, will be drawing out in a little bit more detail. But let us speak for the moment um, from some of those others who ha have had long experience in these, in these matters before, certainly longer than me. Former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans says, trying to drain the Middle East swamps through military action is, as we should know by now, more likely than not to be counterproductive. Not every day that I quote Foreign Minister Gareth Evans in here. The UN Commissioner of Inquiry uh, into, the Syria, uh, into the conflict in Syria, led by Paolo Pinheiro, 
says a resonant cry for peace and accountability rings out. The war is increasingly driven by international and regional powers, primarily in accordance with their respective geostrategic interests. The competition among regional powers for influence has resulted in an alarming exacerbation of the sectarian dimension instigated by the uh, intervention of foreign fighters and extremist clerics. This is what Australia is now implicated in, and we could have played a profoundly positive role in the de-escalation of the conflict inside Syria, but instead we send F-18s. It is my firm view that this action does not make Australians any safer at all, and I think my colleagues will probably take up that thread in their contributions. But while the focus, however briefly, of the global community is focused on the safety of the Syrian people, um, I think it is, it is worth uh, continuing, uh, continuing along these lines of argument. How do we de-escalate the conflict? How can everybody in a non-partisan way in this place do our bit uh, diplomatically, globally, with those uh, powers that we do have engagement with? Allies like the United States government, allies like Turkey, allies like Saudi Arabia, uh, as distasteful as many of, that, uh, many of us might find that concept. How do we de-escalate this conflict? Many groups and commentators are now turning to de-escalation through local ceasefires as possible measures to address the conflict. These are not theoretical, as I was outlining before. These exist in a small way already on the ground. Most famously advocated by the current UN mediator, Staffan de Mistura, the idea is to spread local and often quite organic uh, grassroots ceasefires until there is a freeze in the conflict across the country and eventually political reconciliation. One, uh, one brief example, in, uh, Turkey and Iran have been involved in negotiating a brief 48-hour ceasefire in Zabadani, a rebel-held town near the Lebanese border that was besieged by Hezbollah for many weeks. It adds to recent signs of new efforts in the region to end the diplomatic deadlock. And it is, I think, quite powerful and important that it is local people on the ground inside Syria um, who are driving for this demilitarisation. But it is because so many regional powers now have a part in this conflict, now including Australia, it requires that diplomatic engagement amongst regional powers to make the ceasefires stick. Stephen Simon, who is the United States National Security Council Senior Director for the Middle East and North Africa between May 2011 and January 2013, and Jonathan Stevenson, the NSC's Director for Political Military Affairs over the same period uh, between November 2011 and May 2013, puts it this way. The most realistic short-term policy goal in Syria is to find ways to limit the areas of the a country in direct conflict with the aim of both containing extremist violence and significantly reducing the number of non-combatant deaths. This goal, he, they go on, is not as far-fetched as it sounds. There is already a basis for pursuing it through a series of local ceasefires that could, if properly implemented and enforced, provide a path towards stability in several regions of the country, even as conflict continues elsewhere. In particular, clusters of ceasefires around Hamar, Homs and Damascus, possibly Aleppo, could help end the conflict in a larger region along Syria's principal north-south axis, bringing a degree of normality to daily life in a vital sector of the country. And that is how the UNHCR is able to do its job. That is how they are able to then bring aid back into the country, that partners and Australia could play an immensely powerful role in doing this, can then deliver aid to the people who need it most. And it is aid that we should be, that we should be dropping into that country not more munitions. I uh, look forward to hearing the contributions of other senators in this debate, but I would have thought that the proper time for this debate was before the deployment, not afterwards. And I think it's extraordinary that the Australian Labor Party would say one thing in the House of Representatives, one thing on various interviews on television, we're pro-bombing, we're just going to let the government go ahead, blank check, report to parliament you know, at your leisure, let us know how it's all going which was effectively the essence of what Mr Shorten told the country yesterday. And then Ms Plebisak last night in the media, you know, quite correctly, uh, expressing extreme concerns, similar kind of concerns that I've expressed this afternoon, that we risk inflaming an, or an already volatile situation. Where is the opposition today? Where are you? Because the proper time for a debate in parliament about the deployment of the ADF into a war zone on the other side of the world is before the deployment, not after it's already underway because we don't know where this is going and the Abbott government has provided us no rationale, no exit strategy, no end game, no success criteria. We do not trust the government's motives, nor do we trust its competence. 
to carry out any kind of productive military intervention into the civil, uh, Syrian civil war. The solutions lie elsewhere, and that's what this parliament needs to be engaged with today and in coming months.